Welcome. Good evening. My name is Corrector Francis. I'm uh, one of the associate directors and director of education here at the Montshire. And uh, this is our second of this series of programs about pollinators, working with the Hanover Conservation Commission's Pollinator Work Group um, and Biodiversity Group. I think they've been doing a great job, and we'll introduce some other folks later on. We have one more of these lectures coming up on the 26, which is supporting native bees and garden meadows. Correct? Um, and then there's, if you haven't picked up on these little blue pieces, um, this has all the different activities that are going on around this work. Um, so we're, we're, we are extremely pleased to be hosting these uh, this series and being part of the partnership. There is a whole crew of wonderful people and organizations that are working with, with this um, valley. Um, and usually when I'm up here introducing some programs, I also want to always like give a little introduction to some ac upcoming activities for, uh, for adults that you may be interested in. If you're looking for having a good beer and listening to some fun music and building a giant cardboard city with a bunch of millennials and you want to feel young again, tomorrow night we have our Unleashed. It's for 21 and up, um, cash bar, and it's, it's great. So you can come here and play with him. But uh, we have a lot of other events happening all the time, but April 22nd this year is Earth Day. In addition to being Earth Day, many of you may have also heard that it is March for Science Day. And across the country, there's going to be a lot of marches and a lot of activities about the importance of science. And, and at the Monshire, I'm thinking, do we really need to do anything? I mean, yes, we stand for science. It's the Monshire Museum of Science. Um, but in fact, we are going to be doing something because uh, we, pride our, we pride ourselves on being a neutral space where people from all different persuasions can come and discuss different issues. Um, but every now and then there, there's an issue and a, and a role for even a place like the Contra Museum to play a little bit of advocacy. We're not organizing a march. If any of you would like to organize a march that starts, for instance, on the darkest green, and it ends here on Saturday. We would more than welcome that. But we are having a Montshire Day for Science. A lot of activities are happening. Um, and in addition to all of typical fun hands-on science and working with some of our uh, research colleagues at the college and at Krell and elsewhere, and talking about doing some climate science activities and all sorts of good stuff, we're going at 2 o'clock, we're going to have a series of short presentations on why science matters. And that is not going to be a necessarily child-friendly set of presentations. It'll be 15, 20 minutes each. But we're going to have a quick Climate Science 101 with uh, Dr. Mary Albert from Dartmouth, uh, who does, uh, she actually worries about where all the ice drilling happens in the world when we look at ice cores. And what we know about climate, it is changing, it is impacting us. How do we know and, uh, and what can you do about it? Um, and then uh, following her is going to be uh, Dean Helpley, who Joe is the Dean of Thayer School of Engineering. He's going to talk about the importance of funding science and engineering at the R&D level as an investment. Uh, and then we'll have a PhD candidate talking about just science for the sake of the human endeavor of, of, of reaching for the stars. Where, where are we from? What, where we fit in the universe? And lastly, um, our director, Marco Staffney, will be talking about the role of Monshire in scientific literacy. So there's a series of quick lectures that I'd love to have you here. If you're looking for a place to go and you don't want to fly down to Washington and put up the carbon, um, come to the Monshire on the 22nd and, and then you can yell and share some stories and, and be part of an event. With that, I'm going to pass it on to John Fountain, who's some of you may know, former uh, retired county forester uh, with the state of Vermont, and, um, and he and I have way too many different little odd circles of, of relationships, um, but he's going to end up introducing and moderating tonight's program. You great. Um, welcome. Uh, just excited. We're really glad to see this, uh, this learning how to keep the mic here. Um, <laughs> um, excited to see this crew, and uh, welcome. A lot of people here. Um, uh, I'm, in addition, having been a forester working for the state of Vermont presently, I'm the chair of the Hartford Conservation Commission, so we're one of the one of the smaller partners here that's hoping to helping to make this stuff happen. Um, it's a great project, um, and uh, I just want to read the, uh, the the mission statement of the partners. The Upper Valley Pollinator Partners is a coalition to promote the awareness of the decline of native pollinators 
and to inspire actions to reverse this decline. Um, and there, as I said, there are a number of partners, including a number of the schools around here, some of which are producing pollinator plants, which will be or plants that are good for pollinators, um, and they will be available in the future in a number of food groups and conservation commissions. So this, today, um, our presentation is, um, uh, we're going to go until you know, about 8.30. We have about an hour's worth of, um, of actual presentation that's going to happen. Um, we have um, Alan Eaton is an entomologist at UNH. He's going to be giving a um, presentation. Will Allen um, has been a, an activist in uh, um, sustainability and, um, and how to grow food and things without pesticides. Um, he's also going to give a presentation. We also have Janet Cavanaugh. Janet is a landscape architect um, from South Stratford who is also very interested in reducing um, or not using at all um, pesticides. Um, and today's program is, uh, to a large extent, is how could we grow what we want to grow without the use of pesticides. And so I'm looking forward to some good ideas, and we're also looking forward to having some questions and some discussion afterwards. So we are, we're going to start off with uh, Will Allen. Um, Will is the, one of the managers of the Cedar Circle Organic Farm in Thetford. Um, and he became involved with that in the year 2000. It is a long history as an organic farmer, student of the pesticide industry, and an activist. Um, he's a native of California. He grew up on a farm, studied anthropology, and earned a PhD in that field with a study of forest far for, excuse me, a study of forest farmers in Peru. He taught at the University of Illinois in California, and also been farming organically since 1968. So he's got some experience. In 1990, he founded the Sustainable Cotton Project um, to help farmers learn how to grow organic cotton and convince garment makers how to use, uh, that they should use organic fiber, fibers. In Vermont, he's been active in the coalition to label GMO products, resulting in the Vermont law to do this. Currently, he's involved as a research director of Regeneration Vermont, which he co-founded recently. And their goal is to redirect Vermont agriculture towards methods that protect and enhance the natural environment. Um, and he also has in the back of the book, he's got a display, and uh, um, his book, The War on Bugs, is also here. So Will, welcome. Thanks a lot. <coughs> Thanks a lot, I'm, um, I'm glad you all showed up. Um, it was a nice turnout. Um, every time spring happens, everybody gets excited, and I get to get out in the yard again. So we're all excited because uh, we start at the farm in mid-February. And we started greenhouses, and now if you go in our greenhouses, it's spring. Right? And so every day we actually are have flowering plants around because we started so early and so that you all can buy uh, product from us. So um, for a long time I've been trying to convince people that uh, we, have, we probably don't need to use chemicals and um, we get really good yields and quality without them and um, the negative effects are so terrible that we ought to really start rethinking them and a lot of countries around the world have. For example, Bhutan is going completely organic and Denmark is going organic and the state of Sikkim in India is totally organic. They've stopped using, large parts of Cuba are totally organic. You can't use chemicals in Havana. And so, that means, obviously, you know, we have this huge organic industry now. We can do this without these chemicals. And so really, who they benefit um, are really the chemical manufacturers. And a lot of farmers, like myself, we call them our tools, but they're not our tools. They belong to Dow and Monsanto and DuPont and you know and they've always belonged to them. Those companies are old. And um, when we are doing the sustainable cotton project uh, in California, a lot of people ask us, well, how do people get away with spraying these chemicals on schools and on the rivers and canals and churches and every place really? On the, we would take bus tours of people to show them cotton country and the bus would get sprayed every time. 
Because they were killing all the cotton plants so they could, they're defoliating them so they could harvest them. So we decided, well, let's uh, write a book about it. So we wrote this book, The War on Bugs, which is a history of um, how farmers got talked into using these chemicals. And so I've just done a little brief survey of that, just to give you an idea of, well, this is old. This is a lot older than we think. A lot of times we think, well, um, the use of chemicals started after the Second World War. They were all war toys, right? And they got turned into lawn chemicals and agricultural chemicals. But it really started um, after the Civil War, when they first started using arsenic, and then sulfuric acid, and then arsenic and lead. And, and so I just try to tell this story really quickly so that you get an eye, uh, just a survey. And if you want an in-depth survey of it, the book, The War on Bugs, uh, <coughs> I bought a bunch of them, so I sell them for 10 bucks. And, you know, if you get them from Amazon, they're 30, so. <laughs> anyway, so um, the first, um, let me just, can we just go back one? Yeah, okay, down. So um, we wanted to know who invited all these uh, chemicals to dinner, right? Because all of a sudden, we realized they're in all of our food. And uh, who really invited them were the university and uh, chemical companies themselves, and the media, because the chemical companies started controlling the farm magazines, and, uh, and the government, the United States Department of Agriculture and the Food and Drug Administration. Those were the people that invited these chemicals to dinner, and they're the ones that keep them at our dinner table. So, the next slide, please. So the first, um, you can tell how old this is because the first uh, anti-pesticide and food movements started in the 1880s, so the struggle is in old And um, in 1869, um, the Colorado Potato Bowl was actually following the railroad across the country and it started in, uh, infesting all the potato fields. And nobody could kill it. Nobody had a, a cure for it, right? And the most comical cures would occur in the farm magazines. Two pieces of wood that you would smash the bread together and they would sell that to you and it would come in a kit, right? And so there was all this crazy stuff that they were trying to kill these bugs with and so they finally started putting um, um, Paris green on it, which was a green paint pigment, right? That was mostly arsenic, right? And um, that was the beginning of chemical agriculture in this country, really. And the time period was really right around the close of the Civil War. So next slide, please. Um, and, and the next thing that happened is once these chemicals became really, um, once they became really effective, especially arsenic, arsenic was, well, it's a killer. I mean, you know, hardly any uh, pest developed uh, resistance to it for 35 years, right? So for 35 years, nothing, you know, Everything was killed by it, basically, right? And so it was used and used and used, and, and the chemical companies started getting questions, well, is it safe? And they deferred all of those questions. It wasn't safety that they were after, it was effectiveness, right? And so they, they deferred all of the safety questions, and they fought all of the concerns about safety in Congress and, and um, and in the press, they control the press, and so they, you know, tried to calm people's fears. And um, so, again, it's this, you know, it's kind of like a fourfold model they developed here. You know, we have this clever ad, uh, editorial, a clever um, ad that goes with the editorial, and then a um, like a statement from a really successful farmer, like this stuff really worked for me. And see what they, what the chemical companies do is they give you the chemicals for three years, and then if they're successful, they want you to write out a statement of how successful they are. And then they get the <laughs> university researchers to do the research, and then they say, wow, this is a very effective chemical, and these are the nozzle sizes you use, and this is the dose rate, right? And so here's this fourfold ad, and that ad program still exists in all the farm magazines today. It's exactly the same ad that you would find in the 1880s you can find right now. Um, and that government was so in favor of it that in 1894 they put out a, a bulletin favoring the use of arsenic and lead and they continued to favor the use of it. 
Next slide. In 1903, um, the Royal Society in London, you know, passed restrictions on the use of arsenic and lead in food and drink. But the United States refused to go along with it. They, they, they were trying to protect the big farmers, and they were trying to protect them then, and they still are trying to protect them now. The USDA and the FDA are really in the pockets of the chemical companies. Uh, in 1905, Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle, and that was an attack on the meatpacking industry, but it was also an attack on food safety, right? And then, um, and after that, the Pure Food and Drug Act was passed, which was the forerunner to the Food and Drug Administration. Next slide. But it was under the USDA that it was put, right? And so it had to favor farmers, because the USDA was there to support farmers, not to be an enforcer, right? So you can see, like, by the 1880s, 1890s, there people were already complaining, you know, in the newspapers about you know serious amounts of poison grapes on sale, and you could tell they were poisoned with arsenic as they turned green, right? The arsenic was made them look green. Next slide. And then it, this is a um, this is a 1920s, you know, same thing, and now it's on apples, right? And all these apples were starting to come from uh, from Washington and be able to ship across the country and then ship to Europe, right, because they finally had railroads and so forth. Next slide. Then in 1928, um, Standard Oil hired Theodore Geisel, who's Dr. Seuss, um, because they saw an ad, or actually a cartoon that he had done on the judge, which is an old uh, cartoon magazine. And, um, and that ad uh, showed uh, him using a flit gun in the cartoon. So the next slide. And here's one of his, <coughs> this is that first cartoon that Dr. Seuss did for Standard Oil. And Dr. Seuss worked for Standard Oil from 1928 until 1943. Mm -hmm. And then in 1943, he joined the Army, and he was Captain Theodore Geisel. He became Theodore Geisel again. And he was the promoter of DDT for the Army. And and then he wrote the Lorax as a makeup book. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a complex. Everybody feels like that's in the pesticide industry. Feels like he was the most effective pesticide salesman in history because he made people laugh about it, right? So here is this totally terrible thing that people were spraying on stuff, but he gave you this comfort zone, and pe and the chemical companies rushed into that comfort zone and used cartoons for years and years and years to try to sell. Chemicals, and there are probably people in this room that are my age, I'm 80, that used flit guns when they were kids, right? But flit guns were the common pesticide sprayer when we were kids, right? My mom, that's what I had to spray is, is flit. And then when DDT came along, we just put DDT in the flit gun, right? So, um, even though, you know, Dr. Seuss was making people uh, feel good, there were serious problems. People were really getting sick from a lot of these chemicals that were being used because there were no regulation whatsoever on them. Next slide, please. Um, and then the Consumers Union uh, came into being. They, uh, they came into being in 1933 and they wrote a book called 100 Million Guinea Pigs, which was all about, in, in the, one, of the, um, one of the chapters is a steady diet of arsenic and lead. Because almost everybody had arsenic and lead poisoning because it was in everything. It was on wallpaper and in cosmetics and in all the food and it was literally in all the clothes and so it was literally every place. And then the second book was Eat, Drink and Be Wary and the third book was 40 Million Guinea Pig Children, which was really the most effective book because it got to people about their kids. Right? Okay, um, and, th and then, you know, we've lived with this long history of pesticide poisoning, right? And probably one of the worst is the Bhopal incident in India in 1984, when a poison gas leak for cotton producing chemicals really leaked and you know killed 8,000 people and blinded 200,000, right? And, um, and we've never made reparations in companies that were responsible for it was Union Carbide, and then that was bought by Bayer Aspirin, and, and they've never paid them back for any of that. So this is kind of what we're living with. Next slide. Um, in the 1920s and 30s, several <coughs> important pesticides and 
uh, fertilizers were introduced and there's nerve and mustard gas, cyanide, sarin and taboon. Sarin they just used in uh, Syria, right? I mean, it's one of the worst nerve poisons in history. The bromides including DBCP and methyl bromide, DDT and telon 2 and then fluorine and uh, nitrogen fertilizer, which was also used for bomb material, and the organophosphate pesticides. And then, next slide, please. And then after World War II, all of those materials were applied on the farms, right? They became the... Uh, that's why everybody says, oh, they didn't start using chemicals until after the Second World War. That's why they started using a lot more chemicals, but they've been using them since the Civil War. And then after they started using all these chemicals, they introduced antibiotics, which enabled them to put all the animals <coughs> in the same pen, right? So they have maybe 200,000 chickens in a pen, or, you know, they have six, six, 10, 12,000 cows right now, milk cows, right, in one facility. And then by the 1990s, uh, um, they developed, um, you know, all of these uh, incredibly effective hormones, right? And, and then in the, uh, really in the mid-90s, they developed a, a genetically modified crop, but they did it in cooperation with um, USDA. And as the other pesticides failed, the corporation developed the neonicotinoids that we're going to be talking about a lot in just a few minutes. Next slide, please. And like this is what I perceive the USDA is like, really, and that's what a lot of people feel it's like. Well, it's it's a joke organization because most of the food uh, chemicals and the lawn chemicals are not regulated because they split the regulation between FDA and USDA and EPA, and so it's like same thing with the military. You know, you never know which budget is going where, and they're in competition with each other for budget, right? And with each other for who regulates, right? So, um, so our deal is like, you know, we're trying to regulate factory farming, and we really feel like, you know, there's a good reason to do it. Factory farming is responsible for a big part of our greenhouse gas emissions, right? If we don't fix farming, you know, we can give it up on trying to fix climate change because Agriculture is really the, I mean, soil is the biggest sink for carbon on the planet. And so, but if we don't, if we farm poorly with all these chemicals, then that carbon is just eaten up with the chemicals, right? But if you farm organically and regeneratively, then um, basically we can sequester most of the carbon that's in the atmosphere and in the oceans. And, because that's going to be there for the next 500 years. We're not going to get rid of CO2 or nitrous oxide for 500 years. That's how long they stay in the atmosphere. And so it's really good to stop emissions, but the other thing is you have to bail the boat out. So that's what we're about. And thanks a lot for coming and I appreciate it. So next we have Alan Eaton, and he's an entomologist with the Department of Biological Sciences at UNH. And he's been part of the extension system there since 1978, and teaching farmers and gardeners how to reduce their pesticide use. He's the statewide coordinator of integrated pest management programs to help growers reduce their dependence on chemical pesticides. And he's worked with organic growers. He's a specialist in the insect, insect pesticides, excuse me, specialist in the insect pest <coughs> fruits, um, and he studied the distribution and biology of deer ticks in New Hampshire and educated the public on this pest. Alan. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, you'll have a chance to grill Will and myself later with your toughest questions. The tough ones go to Will. I get the easy ones. Uh, in the back, there's a couple of publications with my name on them, and I brought them here to because these kinds of presentations, I get questions about, well, do you have a publication on this? Or do you have one on that? I listed a whole bunch of them here, as well as other resources that might be of interest to you. Uh, one of them, by the way, the one that's in black and white, has two sides to it. And the flip side is a real shorthand version of notes 
for what I'm going to say for the next uh, uh, 40 minutes, 44 minutes, I promise, Barbara. Okay. So uh, uh, this is your chance. If you wish, you can fall asleep, and then at 43 minutes from now, you can wake up again and read the notes, and you'll know what I said. Barbara, we can go ahead. Even if you do not plan to use pesticides, chemical pesticides, I strongly urge that you write this number down and put it by your telephone. Uh, in my house, we have cleaning agents. Uh, there's all kinds of other things a two-year-old could get his or her hands on. We have taxes bushes, uh, eating the, 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 the berries on those, toxic. There's, there's all kinds of ways people can get into trouble. And so this telephone number works from any place in the entire country. It figures out what area code you're calling from, and it connects you with the Poison Information Center for your area, which for us is Mary Hitchcock Hospital that way. And the only short distance. How many people tonight from New Hampshire? All right. <laughs> uh, uh, Grafton County, most of you? But a few somewhere else? Okay, so, so mostly from the valley area, and again, for the people from Vermont, mostly from the valley area, I'm assuming? Orange County, okay, good. Just, just wanted to check. Uh, uh, we can go ahead, Barbara. Uh, I teach people about pest management. I was brought here in 1978 to run a New Hampshire Cooperative Extensions programs in pest management. You heard Will talking about how we got to this point uh, in this country, our heavy dependence on chemical use in particular for dealing with pest problems. So when I arrived, um, a program had just been started, funded by the feds, that aimed to reduce our dependence on, uh, over-dependence on these things, and it was called Integrated Pest Management. And the idea was, instead of using one technique alone which many people would use as chemical insurance, basically spray every Tuesday or every Saturday. It, that worked, but they had a few little minor problems, uh, environmental <laughs> contamination, wasting products, uh, great expense, exposure to materials, killing uh, beneficial organisms, uh, resistance developing, and on and on and on. So instead we teach people to manage pest problems we have them use a combination approach. So you use several techniques together, not just one. And I teach not only backyard growers how to do this kind of thing, but commercial growers. We apply the same stuff to, to my tick lectures. I think next week I'm up in Thetford talking about ticks. Let's talk about the first one first. Uh, let's talk about suppression and prevention. Go ahead, uh, Barbara. And you can go ahead again. One of the first things I recommend to people relative to a backyard situation is that you make and use a garden plan. It helps you not only in efficiency of planning and knowing just how much space you need, but I learned year to year, this is an early one when I had some things that were placed too closely together, but you learn how much you need to get, how, much, how many plants you need to produce, how much seed you need to get, and it also helps me understand and remember, because I can't remember what I wore yesterday, let alone where I planted the corn last year. Was it this corner or that? I rotate my crops around, and this helps me do that. So there's many benefits to doing this, making and using a garden plan. Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, using resistant varieties, this is a photo from an old uh, garden catalog. And uh, you can see these slicers, Market Moor was a variety I think is still available. Um, and you can tell by looking in the catalog that that particular variety was resistant to cucumber, mosaic virus, downy mildew, powdery mildew, and scab. And you could uh, easily select varieties that were resistant to various pests. And especially with respect to resistance to uh, diseases, this is fairly easy to do. The information is harder to come by relative to insects, but it's out there for those of you who seek it out. For example, anybody grow squash and pumpkins? There's a little critter called the squash vine borer. 
that hits many of our squash and pumpkins and creates all kinds of problems for us. One of the worst problems is for commercial growers is they know the time they have to spray it is when the plant is in bloom. That's the time we want to protect pollinators. What are we going to do? There's some species that are resistant to this. Anything in the cucurbita moshada group, most of the squash and pumpkins are cucurbita pipo or cucurbita maxima, but butternut squash is a different species, cucurbita moshada, and uh, a squash vine borer almost never attacks it, and when it tries, they don't l live very long. It's uh, too resistant. So here's an example of one where you can get resistant varieties, and I major in butternut squash in my garden for that reason. <laughs> and so there's other examples of this where if you look, you can find the information. One of the things that I see most commonly that I recommend to uh, backyard growers is to get into the habit of when something is done producing, you chop it up and plow it under and, and, and pull it out of the garden. I went to uh, visit a colleague. We were going to go to a conference. I waited out by the garden, and there were three or four chopped off heads of cabbage that had just been cut to be put into slaw and other stuff for the evening meal. But, but a couple of them clearly had been cut quite a long time ago. And I said, what are you going to do? And he said, well, we just leave the plants there. You know, once they, they've done their part. And I said, don't you worry about pests? And he says, they can eat as much as they want of those. I'm, I'm done with that in a plant. And I said, but there's four or five different species of insects that have multiple generations a year. And if you keep that crop residue out there, then they're going to go and attack the broccoli and the Brussels sprouts that you've got across the garden. So if you take these plants and chop them up and put them under after you're done with harvest and right after, it eliminates the possibility for a second generation or a third or a fourth or a fifth generation to develop on those things. It's especially important in corn, sweet corn in particular, uh, once some people wait till the end, I, I won't say what side of the river this photo was from, but uh, some uh, people wait until the autumn when the leaves are out to chop corn under. Uh, in my garden, I put it under as soon as that particular planting is done, and I put something else in spinach or something else in instead. Brassicas, uh, some of the others. Um, one of the things I also recommend to people is to consider uh, uh, evaluating your pollen and nectar sources, not only for the benefit of the pollinators, but many of the parasitic insects that are beneficial and help us out in the garden uh, feed, on feed on nectar and some on pollen as well. And if the, the critter itself is only a millimeter long, imagine how tiny its gas tank is. And if it's going to fill up with the nectar, and then, then how far is it going to get? If you've got a 20-acre field with nothing but corn, and there's no, how many gardeners have a field that big? <laughs> okay, just. So if you have something that big and there's no flower, flowers in there with nectar sources for them, they're not going to get to the interior of that planting. Whereas if you have flowers incorporated, it, all over, uh, then they're going to have a much better chance to be able to live longer, attack more of the pests, and do more good for you. And I also try to people, get people to think about the idea of looking at the whole season. It just started in New Hampshire. We've got summer already. It was the other day. <laughs> And so I try to look and see if I've got something in bloom all season long, all the way up until frost, because that's what the pollinators and some of the other beneficials are going to need. They need food sources, not just, so if you plant just one species that blooms at one time, that's great for those 10 days, but we want to evaluate and have stuff the entire season. So diversity of species and something that's available all through the season. Here's an example. Anybody know what species this one is? Uh, red clover. It is a clover. Which one? Uh, yeah. This one's crimson clover. And this is an example of a plant that has, uh, each of those flowers is actually a composite, because there's one flower there, and another one there, another one there, another one there, 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 there. And they're really deep. And many of our native bees have very short tongues. And so even though there's all kinds of wonderful nectar there, there's a whole lot of species that can't make any use of it. <laughs> my tongue is so short. 
<laughs> so we want to have a diversity of species. Can you go back one, Barbara? So I think I should, the Queen Anne's lace is an example of another one. That, that's a composite head, a, a, an umbel, and that's very, very short distance to the nectar on that species and others in that family. So if we have a variety of flowers, the long-tongued bees and the short-tongued bees can get what they want and other and parasites and so forth as well. Go ahead, Barbara. Um, I emphasize that people evaluate, uh, uh, if you're going to try to grow things while minimizing use of chemical pesticides, that you emphasize the pest easy crops. Do you know what this one is? It's actually snap peas. Uh, uh, this is sugar snap. This is one I've been growing for years and years. Um, I've only had one other than woodchucks and deer, which love it. Uh, the only time I had a significant problem with these, you'll never guess what the pest was, so I'll tell you now, it was snapping turtles. <laughs> they came in when I didn't have a fence, and they dug the whole place up and ruined it. Other than that, I've never had pest problems on these things. So once I fenced this in, so this is an example of a pest easy crop. Beans are relatively pest easy. Spinach is relatively pest easy. Uh, if I'm talking about, what's the next one, Barbara? Well, uh, uh, so potatoes, I think, are an example of a vegetable that's really pest prone. I tried to make a list and then I forgot to bring it today. There's something on the order of a dozen insects that we have in New Hampshire that attack this, and something on the order of 15 or 16 viruses, and then a whole bunch of fungi. So this is an example of a pest prone crop. If we're talking about uh, fruit, tree fruit, I think of apples as pest prone because they stay on the tree a long, long time, and people want absolutely perfect blemish-free fruit. And so there's a number of reasons why that's a, a kind of pest prone, whereas uh, a fruit, uh, blueberries, are less uh, pesty. So uh, uh, emphasize the pest easy ones and de-emphasize the pest prone ones if you're going to try to reduce the use of pesticides, especially the chemical pesticides. <coughs> Control the weeds. This is my garden, by the way. Uh, anybody know what this weed is? Say it louder, I heard the word. It is, it's mustard, it's yellow rocket, which is in the mustard family. And so weeds themselves compete with our uh, garden plants for uh, space and sunlight and for soil moisture and for the nutrients in the soil. So themselves they're pests and competitors, but also this is in the mustard, it's in the same group as broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. So when I see a, a field that's full of these and a garden that's full of these, I say, oh wow, they're gonna have a real hard time with the pests that control, ca that attack cabbage and other stuff in that family. So think of these as also harboring pests. And I'm, you know, I suppose if it's thick enough, it could hide the woodchucks too. But I'm thinking of the insects and, and the fungi and so forth that will jump from this weed to its relatives that you're growing right next to it. So think of this aspect when you're thinking about gardening and controlling the weeds. Let's move on and talk about monitoring. And I've got a publication on the website called uh, Using Visual Aids or something like that, Magnifiers and Other Visual Aids in Pest Management. Um, I wrote this only a couple of years ago because way back when I didn't need to have glasses or magnifiers or anything like that, but now I have to and I can identify with the situation. They're very useful to uh, help us uh, dealing with things and many people don't know how to use them properly. So this pub publication, which is three or four pages, tells you about the advantages and the disadvantages of the various types and how to use them properly and where to get them. So that's one thing to think of. They're going to try to be identifying critters. Some of them are well, some of them have light, some of them don't. Let's go to the next one, Barbara. There we go. Anybody have this particular book? Seen this particular one? Worm Talk and Slug Speak? <laughs> uh, 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 one of my friends wrote a book and he sets a line in it, something to the effect that more pests are controlled in, in an easy chair in, in January. <laughs> and what he meant was, you're reading about it and understanding and learning the system. So if you understand and recognize the kinds of damage, as well as the insects and the fungi and bacteria and so forth that can attack your 
of crops, then you're better prepared when the season comes along. So I, I garden all year round, but in the winter time, I'm gardening by my wood stove in, the, in an easy chair looking at a book. And it really helps you during the growing season. Go ahead, Barbara. I talk about the concepts of pest of thresholds. A threshold is a concept that was introduced by economic entomologists to try to get people off the pesticide treadmill and try to get them to think about the way we're using pesticides and to, if you're going to have to use them, use them only when you really do need them. And so this concept of the threshold was developed. And basically, it's the balance point, the point with the, the cost-benefit balancing point, the point where the damage that the pet, the, it's that population of pest where the damage from that pest exactly equals the cost of controlling the pest. And so if the population reaches the threshold and goes above it, it's worthwhile to apply the pesticide or whatever control you're going to use. And if it is below the threshold, it costs you more money to apply this, te whatever it is, a physical, mechanical, chemical, whatever technique, than it's worth. Therefore, the recommendation is don't. So, pest, uh, so thresholds have been developed for a number of crop and pest situations, relatively few in a backyard situation, sometimes because we value our gardens a little differently. But you can still use the same concept. In my garden, I talk about, and when I'm talking with gro uh, backyard growers, I talk about the concepts of indirect pests and direct pests. Uh, I work with apples a lot, so I'll give an example from apples. <coughs> European red mite is an example of an indirect pest of apples. It attacks the leaves. I don't eat the leaves myself. I eat the apples, the fruit. So that's why it's an indirect pest. It's attacking a part of the plant, which it helps support the growth of the apples, but it doesn't hit the apples themselves. So it's an <coughs> indirect pest. The threshold for uh, European red mite at the, in the middle part of the summer is five to seven mites per leaf. Think of a 30-foot apple tree and how many bazillion leaves there must be on that apple tree. I don't know how many that is per tree, but that's a lot. On the other hand, plum curculio is a very serious insect uh, uh, that attacks a very serious insect pest of apples, it attacks the fruit themselves. It's a direct pest. Fruit that are attacked by plum curculio tend to drop off the tree long before harvest, and therefore they're lost to us. So there's a very serious pest. So for direct pests, the threshold for plum curculio is far less than one per tree. Far less. And so if you use this as a general concept, it helps you put things in perspective as to what's serious and what isn't. We get into uh, uh, patterns of being proud of our gardens and proud of our lawns that look so great and so forth, but I want people to start thinking about these concepts of the values and the costs of making these various choices. And then when you make your choices, have, have, make it that you've done it after having thought things through a bit. Let's go to the next slide. Here's how I do this in my place. This is my garden again. Um, these little critters uh, attack my grapes, attack my raspberries and blackberries, and I don't mind having, this is a, 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 a few, but this is a little more than I'd like to see. I don't mind having a few holes on the leaves, but when they're so abundant that they start attacking my fruit, that's when I put my foot down. And so that's how I do, that's the way I apply these kinds of things and be thinking about this. How serious is the pest problem really? Let's go to the next one. Uh, please, uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, monitoring for insect traps, uh, monitoring in with insect traps, this is one I want you to know about. I don't think I will ever, as long as I live, recommend that anyone buy these things. This is a trap for Japanese beetles. Uh, my colleague Dan Potter and his graduate students down at the University of Kentucky, or is he in Tennessee? Uh, did research to try out these commercially available traps, and yes, they do catch Japanese beetles. But he proved that they, they're far more attractive at attracting them in 
and they're very poor at catching what they attract in. Therefore, they end up increasing the population. So this is why I don't recommend you use this one. Um, but there are traps that are out there. I was going to ask people to make the pledge, but we won't do that tonight. Go ahead, Barbara. <laughs> On our website, you can see I work with commercial growers. We have an insect called the spotted wing Drosophila which uh, uh, made it to New England in 2011 and uh, has been a real problem for us. And this is one where we help the growers monitor with traps. They're not designed to trap it and control it. They're designed to monitor how many are up there so you know if the population is going up or going down and help decide what they're going to do. Uh, for, for there are some examples of some of these, and for those of you that grow blueberries or raspberries, you can go to our website and see how we recommend uh, monitoring for these particular things and the details. Go ahead, Barbara. Let's move on and talk about controls. I could give you the whole four or five hour lecture, but I figured you might not like that or be falling asleep. Um, so we talked a little bit about suppressive and preventive measures, especially applied to backyard situations. We talked about monitoring and the various aspects of monitoring and learning what's out there and so forth. And the monitoring is used to tell you whether or not there's a problem and whether or not you may need to apply controls. Now we're looking at various controls and the very first thing I show, now I'll show you the label on this side. So this is what I use when I collect Japanese beetles. And the way I use this is, uh, as you see Faye doing it right here, you don't have to take each beetle and pick it off with your hand. You put this under the branch, you do it in the morning when it's cool, not in the heat of the day, and just tap, and they fall in. And I put a little bit of soapy water, so I put a little bit of soapy water in these, and uh, they drown in them. And so this is what I use on Japanese beetle in my garden. By the way, I've been, I've been gardening in the place I am right now for five years, and I've yet to use a chemical insecticide at all. I grow uh, 400 feet of perennial, square feet of perennials, 500 square feet of annuals, and uh, uh, this is what I use for uh, Japanese beetles. Go ahead, Barbara. There are some insect traps that are out there. This one will eventually be commercially available. This is one devised for uh, apple maggot. Um, we put a little sticky substance on it, and it's used uh, originally used to monitor apple maggots. But if you uh, put enough of them out and put them out properly, they will control them for you. So there's an example of one of the few insect traps that's so effective you could actually use it as a control device. But most of them are monitoring devices. Although, uh, as looking at this uh, plot that we did using spun bonded row covers, uh, I've got a tiny little, this spun bonded row cover right here is for a tiny field. <laughs> <laughs> and in case you're not familiar, I've got a couple of examples of these right here. This is material that's uh, available that commercial growers are all over it. You can put it over the top of the plants. And in this particular experiment, we decided to push it to the limits. We put this spun bonded row cover on when the sweet corn field was that high. The first thing we learned was, remember to put enough slack so it will grow up. <laughs> that was the first thing we learned. Um, and the idea was to leave it on there and he's looking in because we're about to harvest it. First harvest. And we pulled the cover off. And we decided this was really pushing the concept because we weren't sure how much pollination we were going to get. This is wind. Corn is a wind-pollinated crop, but we found that when we did this, um, we had uh, 10 days of earliness. Uh, by the way, in the foreground here, the same variety in the same field planted in the same date. So this stuff is ready to harvest, and that isn't yet. And the only difference was the remain row cover that we put on it. It's warmer underneath that stuff, and it had the extra added benefit of keeping the insects out. So they didn't have to spray for European corn borer, corn earworm, fall armyworm, and some of the other critters that come in and attack stuff. And so the grower was really pleased and put it on the, the uh, put it on his uh, uh, market stand earlier than anybody else in the area. So this one goes to a, a little bit of extreme. Uh, uh, go ahead and push it, Barbara, again and again. So you want to do three things. One, number one, when you do this, um, rotate your crops. <laughs> 
because some insects overwinter in the soil. And so if you didn't rotate, then putting the row cover over just ensures that the pests that overwintered in the soil stay in that area. So instead you rotate your crops. Number two, you put the barrier down before the insects arrive. And, and basically that just means read a little bit and learn when they're supposed to arrive. And you can find that in various gardening guides and fact sheets and so forth. And the barrier doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. There's a couple of rips uh, I don't see in that side, but there were a couple of small rips, and it still worked pretty well. Go ahead. This is in my garden, in my backyard. That's what I do to protect my uh, acorn. I love uh, honey bear, a variety <coughs> that, that uh, my colleague uh, Brent Loy developed. It's an acorn squash, but the uh, squash vine borers love it too. So this is the way I protect it. And I look, and, uh, look for the first female flowers. When I finally start getting female flowers, then the cover comes off and allows the pollinators in. I suppose I could hand pollinate it and do it that way, but this is what I do. So I use the same technology in my garden. Tar paper shields are available commercially. The one you've got right there in the picture is a commercial one that's beautiful round. This is one I made myself out of tar paper the last time I roofed the shingle, uh, shingled the roof. And all I do is I make a slit in the center and make a little bitty Y-shaped uh, notch and then slip that right over this plant, right snugly there as soon as that transplant goes in the ground. When I first started gardening, I religiously used a chemical called, uh, that, that's been so long, diazinon. And I used that as a drench to control cabbage maggot, which would devastate my cabbage crops. I haven't used diazinon in, I couldn't even remember the name. It's so many years, it's been 20 or more years, and I haven't used it since. So I use this particular technique. It forms a barrier that this particular insect can't get through. It lays its eggs at the junction between the stem and the soil. And any that get through, it's black. And so the sunshine warms it up, and it heats up the soil to a higher temperature than the eggs can handle, so it works two ways. I wish I'd thought of that and, and, and patented it. So here's an example that I use. Go ahead. And, and this, again, is my garden. I use cupworm collars. Uh, you can't do it on your beans because every single plant you have to do it on, but I do it on my transplants. And I make a, a little collar out of a, a uh, usually waxed paper, a, a waxed cardboard or something like that. It's going to last a little while. It's just a physical barrier that's only three inches high or so. And I fit it uh, over each transplant and snug it into the ground. And all I want is protect that plant while it's really young and tender, like that bean was. And I dug at the base and there's the cutworm. So it's just to keep the cutworms from getting it uh, while it's really young and tender. When it gets a little bit older and a little tougher, then they can handle it. So a quick barrier that used at the very beginning. Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, anybody heard of surround? Surround is a kaolin product that can be used. Uh, it's called a barrier, but they call it this because I guess that's the best term we could figure out to, to call it. Um, the, the particles, when sprayed properly, can protect against a number of defoliating insects like Japanese beetle. Um, the particle sizes are so small that they plug up the chemoreceptors in the insect's antennae, and the insects can't tell that what they're standing on is the plant they're supposed to eat, dummy. <laughs> and as a result, they don't attack the plant, but you've got to put it on properly. Go ahead and push it two or three times, Barb. There we go. I think there's three. One more. There you go. Um, it requires really uniform coverage. This one isn't the best, because you see there's a blob, and then there's a gap, and then there's a blob, and another gap, and we'd like to see it more uniform, which usually means you have to do several applications. It's fairly easily washed off by the rain. It's uh, uh, non-toxic. Uh, it's fairly expensive, but it's an option. In fact, we're using it in our state, some of our growers, to protect against uh, uh, plum curculio, the insect I mentioned earlier, and apples because there are fewer and fewer viable options to control it for a backyard gardeners. They're growing apples. So uh, that's an example of that. Um, how many people knew that there's such a thing as a biological insecticide? Good, good. All right. 
So uh, most people think of pesticides as things that are chemical agents, and many of them are, but not all of them. This is an example of one which is a workhorse for me. In this particular case, the, prop, the, the brand name is Dipel, but there's several other uh, brand names. The active ingredient is a bacterium, a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, and it's a bacterium that kills caterpillars, but only when the caterpillars eat it. So they could walk all over the surface and not be harmed, and beetles could walk over the surface and not be harmed, and grasshoppers could walk all over the surface and not. It kills caterpillars, but only when they eat it, which means you have to be able to tell a caterpillar from a sawfly. That takes the advanced class. We're not going to have that one tonight. Uh, but when you do that, this is an example of an agent that can be very effective at helping control insect pests. And I use this on my cabbage and broccoli and Brussels sprouts. And uh, once in a while, I, oh, and on my tomatoes as well. So there's an example of one of these. Here's another that's a biological insecticide. In this case, the active ingredient is a fungus called Bouveria bassiana. It's an insect attacking fungus. It can't attack plants. It attacks insects. That's why it was a good uh, 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 thing as a uh, pesticide. There's another one called MET52, which uh, is one that's being used to control ticks. So there's various, oh, that's Metarizium, this one's Bouveria. There's various examples of biological pesticides. These are amongst them. I just wanted to make you realize that when we say pesticide, it's not necessarily a chemical. Go ahead, Barbara. Most chemical insecticides are like double-edged swords, and I try to get people to think about the positives and the negatives before you make the decision to apply a pesticide. Um, obviously, the uh, potential benefits of using it are, are aware to most of us. You know, it will control the pest, it will kill the pest, and protect your crops. And so we know about that side. But we don't often think about, because Will talked about how slickly the advertising is, is set up and how, how neat, the, 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 how uh, reassured and empowered you feel when you read these ads about how good they are. They don't tell you about the possible negatives. And so instead of automatic re reaching for these things, consider both things. Go ahead, Barbara. These are just a few of them to consider. The toxicity of the product to the applicator, to the mixer, to the consumer, to the kids walking through the garden when you told them not to go through the garden because they just sprayed it. Drift. Lawyers call this chemical, tra wait, I have to lower my voice, chemical trespass, Your Honor. <laughs> uh, you, you sprayed it right here, and, and the target plant is right here, but there was a four mile an hour breeze, and it drifted over here, over the line, to your neighbor's yard right there. Drift. Um, killing insect predators, <laughs> parasites, and pollinators. Uh, phytotoxicity, that's burning the plant that you put it on. Uh, killing other things, amphibians, spiders, birds. If it's applied at the incorrect rate, especially too high a rate, you could get an illegal residue, and that, a problem if you're going to sell it or if you're going to eat it. Um, spending money when there was no need, uh, increasing the chances that pests are going to become resistant. Uh, my students and I did an exercise, and we had about 30 of these things. So there's a number of these things to think about as the potential negatives and I want to see people thinking about the decisions rather than automatically applying stuff just to protect the crop in case a pest might appear. Let's talk about bees because this whole series is going to be focusing on pollinators. Uh, some insecticides and a few fungicides are actually quite toxic to uh, bees. An example is some of the neonicotinoid insecticides, thiacloprid and imidacloprid are examples of a couple of these but not all the neonics are especially toxic. Um, the new products, the new labels, the ones out since two, um, 2015, I think, uh, go ahead, have a symbol that looks just like this. And so in addition to the words that say dangerous, this is highly toxic to bees, the highly toxic products are also going to have that B icon on them, at least the ones that were labeled uh, after 2015. 
So this is gradually slipping into use. Of course, it doesn't help us for the one products we purchased before then. But here's a change in regulations to make it a little more visible to us about which ones are especially potentially harmful. The formulation of the pesticide affects the toxicity to bees. By the way, when I say bees, I mean anything in the superfamily Apoidea. Honeybee is not the same as a bee. It is one bee. In my state, there's 200 species of bees that have been described. 200, and they're still looking for more. They're expecting to find more. So there's a lot of species of them. And dust, if you pick a particular product, and you have various forms of that product that's available, the formulation that's the most toxic, if you have the same chemical in each one of them, is the dust formulation. And the reason is because uh, bees have branched hairs. How many people have seen the branched hairs under the microscope already? Did you like it? So we'll turn that on afterwards and you can see it again. Bees have branched hairs on their bodies and po pollen uh, grains are just about the same size as dust particles in dust formulations of pesticides. And because of the same size, they're also electrically electrostatically attracted to the bees' branched hairs. That's what makes bees really good at collecting pollen. And then bees brush it off and pack it in and, and put it along with the food that they're going to eat. So dusts are the formulation that's the most toxic way to apply these things. The next one down that's almost as toxic would be wettable powders for the same reason. Those particle sizes are even smaller, but some of them are in the same range that the, uh, the pollen grains are. The next one down below that would be flowable and emulsifiable uh, and emulsions, emulsifiable concentrates. So those are less toxic, again, with the same chemistry, and the least toxic one, granules. So within the same type of chemistry, the formulation affects toxicity. I think this may be one of the reasons that we're not finding dust formulations anywhere near as commonly as we used to. Uh, I'm glad. The time of day that you apply an insecticide dramatically affects the risk to bees. If you apply stuff, especially in the morning, on a warm, nice, balmy day, that's a bad time for the bees. If you were to apply it in the mid early afternoon, that might be almost as bad for many of them. But late afternoon or dusk, much less risk of uh, acute toxicity to any bees that happen to be there. So if you have a choice, Putting it on late in the, I suppose you can put it on at night, but then you've got to have light night lights and everything. So dusk is, is usually the, the, the best time when we're thinking about this. And the reason is the materials are the most toxic when the sprays are just, just applied and just usually they're wet. When they're nice and fresh and wet, that's when they're most toxic. After they've had a chance to dry, the toxicity goes down a bit. So put it on at dusk, as many hours before the first bees start being active the next morning. So uh, that time of day affects things. Please avoid spraying chemical insecticides on crops in bloom if you possibly can. Uh, that's when the things like this little Andranid or some of the others are the most active. And we try and tell our commercial growers be especially careful not to do it at that particular time. And the message has gotten through. There are insect attacking nematodes. How many people knew that? You can buy them at garden centers. Insect attacking nematodes are little almost microscopic worm-like things. And the species that attack insects will not attack plants. And you can purchase them and you think of them as um, the ones with the num ninjas, little, uh, thousands of little ninjas. But because they actively go through, they go, yeah, and they go through the soil looking for and seeking out the pests and attacking them. And they attack insects. And you can apply them, especially in a situation like soil. So for soil insects, white grubs and sod webworm and things like that, they're really good in that situation. There are some pitfalls. They're expensive. You don't want to store them a long time. Uh, you can even apply them with a sprayer. If you've got a backyard sprayer, you just have to take the little sieve, little screens out of the hose. Otherwise, you'd be spraying little tiny pieces of nematodes. And we don't want pieces, we want the whole nematode to be alive. They look like this under the microscope. 
Go to the next slide, Barbara. One of the problems with this technique is you have to check viability of your shipment before you spray it. This one isn't good. You see how an awful lot of those are straight or nearly straight? That's not good. We want the cur curved up ones, curled up ones. So this is one that uh, had been heated or something and there weren't very many that were still alive. So that's one of the pitfalls of using this particular technique. But they are available especially for soil insects. If you do it the right way, it can be very effective. I'm often asked about purchasing and releasing parasites and predators. Uh, this, in general, this is something I do not recommend outdoors because we already have plenty of these in here. Uh, and it's hard for you to know enough about which ones are appropriate to introduce that you do the right ones. Additionally, many of the ones that are purchased are actually collected in the wild and we're pulling them out of there to bring them somewhere else. There's a lot of problems with that. But applying them indoors can be effective. So if you have a greenhouse or a high tunnel or an interior plantscape, then it's a technique that increasingly is being used. Uh, go ahead, Barbara. Keep going. Um, one of my growers, the first time he used this in his greenhouse, he was so excited about the shipment arrived. And he opened up, he tore open the boxes and went through the greenhouse and distributed it. And his wife told me later, he was so excited, all right. And then he read the instructions. <laughs> and the instructions said, don't do it in the daytime when it's nice and bright. You're supposed to wait till the evening and hose down and get the humidity higher. He probably killed. 200 bucks of this big shipment. So read the instructions when you do it. Oils are frequently used to smother insects and mite eggs. At this time of year, by the way, this is on my apple tree. Do you see the orange eggs there? How many people can see it? Even in the back row, a few of you can see it. All right, good. Um, those are European red mite eggs. And oils are an example of something that can be somewhat selective in that you put them on at this time of year, they're not as likely to affect the beneficial critters because there's relatively few of them that are active. But you can specifically target some of the ones that are real serious problems, like some of the scales or mites. And so they can be part of a program if you have the right kind of a problem. I have a new publication. My secretary gave me this before I left today. It says third draft, and she drew a little smiley face. So it's almost done. We're not, we're not quite ready. Uh, and I'm supposed to review this tonight and see if we've got more mistakes in it. It's called Beneficial Insects in New Hampshire Farms and Gardens. 72 photos and uh, 24 pages. Um, learn to recognize what the beneficial insects look like. This is a cutworm, but this one's doomed. Do you see the oval eggs on it? A tachinid fly came along and laid its eggs on it. How many people saw the movie Alien? <laughs> you remember the scene where they're all eating lunch and then one of them says, oh, I don't feel so good. And then suddenly the scary music starts and the big monster comes out of his stomach and he dies. And so the same kind of thing happens here. The tachinid fly laid an egg on the outside. The larvae have already hatched and they're inside the body of this thing uh, eating it up. And so by recognizing these, you can recognize uh, some of the good guys. Here's an aphid mummy. I had a couple of growers who tried to spray for those. And they said, they're still there. And I said, they're still there because they're dead already. They're mummies. <laughs> Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, this is a selenius. This is a, 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 an assassin bug, one of the predators. This is in my garden, uh, one of the red uvaids. Go ahead. So this new publication is going to be on our website shortly. I wrote it because I wanted people to understand what the good ones look like. Instead of seeing all the fat sheets and all the, the publications seem to concentrate on the, the, the pests. Go ahead, Barbara. So to preserve and protect pollinators, keep pushing there. That's good. Um, there's several things we can do to conserve these things and help them out. Conserve natural areas. Pollinators need nesting habitat and foraging habitat. But if we spray and pave and plow everything, there's not much left for them places to live. So that's one thing we can do. Minimize our dependence on chemical pesticides is another. 
When we're using pesticides, we want to limit the risk to bees by the kinds of things I talked about a minute ago, not spraying stuff in flower and so forth. Go ahead. Reducing tillage to re give the ground nesting species more opportunity. Next one. My colleague Frank talks about what is good bee forage area. Bees get a lot of food, a lot of nectar in wet meadows and almost as much in fens. Gee, next time there's going to be somebody talking about establishing bee meadows, isn't there? I think her name is Kathy Neal. She has the office downstairs from me. Bogs and marshes come next, woodlands with oaks, and then poorest foraging areas for bees, of conifer woods. There's not much for them there. Keep going. Maintaining diversity, a diverse habitat with diverse plant species helps because there's things that have different niches that are active at different times of year, and if they got the food that they need, it, it does better for everybody. Planting bee pastures can help, but remember the trick I talked about, the species having different species of, of, of flowers because the length of the tongue varies. For bumblebees, some of the old timers in New Hampshire put bales of hay out of the edge of the woods. And then voles and mice discover the old bales of hay and make their tunnels in them one year and then abandon them the next year. Bumblebees seek out rodent nests by the smell of the urine. And they use that as their nest the following year. So this is a trick some people in New Hampshire have used. Go ahead, Barbara. So there's our website, extension.unh.edu. You can get this particular publication and dozens of others that will help you through the year. Um, when you go to the website, it looks like the last time I went, it looks something like this. On the upper right, do you see the word publications? Push it again, Barbara. Keep going. Now do you see the word publications? <laughs> and then go to the next one. When you go to, it takes you to the publications page, and then on the left side of the page are all these choices. There's so many hundreds of publications, we put them in different categories, and they're alphabetical within the categories. You could go crazy downloading all these hundreds and hundreds of publications. So that's what we've got at our website that'll help you out. More than just stuff on pests, there's all kinds of things that you see. I think there's one more slide. That's it. So uh, I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, I could go on, as you might guess, for a long, long time. Later on, after we're done with questions, there's photos to look at, there's specimens to look at, there's a microscope of stuff to look at. Thank you for your attention. We've got a little bit of time for questions, and I think it might be useful if you guys are up here instead of uh, jumping up and down from seats and that sort of thing. Thank you. Great. I'm also inviting Janet Cavanaugh up here. She's, a, I think I mentioned earlier, a landscape architect and may have some ideas that she'd like to share. No, it looks like they don't have any questions. We can go. Uh, oh, my goodness. We've got hands all over the place here. Great. Great. Yeah. Sure. Flowers that are more attractive to pollinators? Uh, there are some colors that. Sorry. There are some. Did you hear the question? The question was Are there some colors of flowers that are more attractive to pollinators than others? And my colleague Sandy Rahan and her uh, various students and postdocs have been looking at this and they're finding the answer is different for different species of bees. So there's some groups that really like purples and blues, and others that really like yellows. Um, not so many, I think, have gone after the reds, but those tend to be things that other things will go after. So there are some preferences, but until I hear their studies are done, I can't answer with more accuracy than that. There's, if you're talking about particular species, you could say, oh yeah, certain species like this group more than that. I think that's the best I can say. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, sure. If we've had flowers for a couple of years and we don't know if they've been conditioned by pesticides, does the stuff dissipate over years? Um, 
you know, we don't know what was in the plants that we bought at Home Depot or something like that. I'll probably never buy them again at Home Depot. But. <laughs> The answer depends a little bit on the chemistry of, of the stuff you're dealing with. Back when I started out my work, which was before many of my students were born, we still had a few of the chlorinated hydrocarbons that were out there, and those were examples of long, generally, long, long-lasting materials. Whereas many others were shorter-lived, Many of the materials that we use nowadays are certainly shorter lived than those that were happening during the chemical heyday when chlorinated hydrocarbons were the main uh, products that were being used. But many of the synthetic pyrethroids continue to be active and can affect uh, insects for a long time. My colleague Nubor Bostenian, who was up at Saint Jean in Quebec, and was doing work in orchards, started work on a predator mite uh, just before he retired. And one of his first experiments in the field was to take uh, some leaves that had been sprayed with a synthetic pyrethroid, a standard insecticide within the orchard industry, and bring a, a leaf inside and test every, every week or so uh, if he put it in a container with his predator mites, would they survive? And it turned out that it was still killing mites eight to ten weeks after being applied. It was still killing the predator mites. Hadn't been reapplied. It had left in the sun for ten weeks. So there are some materials that can have a fairly long uh, residual period. Will, did you have any comments to add to that? I wanted, I wanted to ask also that perennials, if they come up again the next year, Will that stuff be residual and killing bugs the following year? With materials that we're applying nowadays, that should not be the case. They should be breaking down. At least that's my that's my expectation. Will, what do you want to say about that? Well, a lot of the chlorinated hydrocarbons are still around. Calthane, which is a miticide uh, called uh, comide or omide, still, still, uh, is that? still with us. And it still, I mean, just five years ago, they found calthane in the water in the San Joaquin Valley of California, and it had uh, large amounts of DDT contamination in it. Because they're related chemicals. Atrazine is another chemical that is a chlorinated hydrocarbon, and they're still using it in Vermont, right across the river, uh, on all the corn, and they use it in New Hampshire, mixed with metolachlor in a mix called Lumax. And it's the most common corn herbicide in uh, New England. And, um, and it's a long-lasting pesticide. That pesticide is probably going to be with us for two or three hundred years. Or they can lead two or three hundred years, at least. Because they're heavy metals. Where are they going to go? You know, they're in the soil for a long period of time. And there are some fields of, um, that are organic where farmers can't grow root crops because there's too much arsenic or lead, and the root crops take up the arsenic and lead. You just have to be careful, and the best thing you can do is get your soil analyzed. I tell people that about their backyard garden, get your soil analyzed, and don't be afraid to spend $22 on your garden to get that analyzed, because it'll tell you an enormous amount of stuff, and it'll tell you if you have high levels of chemicals that you might be worried about, whether they're pesticides or whether they're just naturally occurring in the soil. I'd love to see Vermont and New Hampshire go organic. Are there or any organizations that are heading in that direction? Is there a chit chat in that direction? And I have no idea. Yeah. Um, we actually are uh, causing as much trouble as we can. Um, <laughs> but we're doing it collaboratively in the sense that um, one of the good things to see about the modern world is we keep track of everything. The Germans taught us that during the Second World War, and we learned our lessons well. And so there are, there's a lot of data, that, that government data that exists. And one of the things that we've done for years, when we were running the cotton project, and uh, when we run Cedar Circle Farm, and now we're running this organization called uh, Regeneration Vermont. And the goal of that organization is to try to get organ uh, Vermont to go organic, to be the first state in the United States to go organic. And we've been working with Ben and Jerry's for the last three years because we analyzed the data on corn in Vermont and found out that the pesticides used on corn had increased 39% after 
genetically modified corn became dominant, and we found that uh, nitrogen fertilizer increased by 17%. Then we took that data to Ben and Jerry's and to the Secretary of Agriculture, and now Ben and Jerry's is trying to figure out, well, how can we switch over to organic, and we're trying to help them out. And the idea is to try to get, same thing we did in cotton, is try to get you know, significant companies to make the change. We got Patagonia to make the change, right? And you know, organic cotton, and that got Esprit to make the change. And then that got Reebok to do it. And then it got Levi's to use that cotton, right? And that's what we're trying to do with Ben & Jerry's. If we can get Ben & Jerry's, which is an international company now owned by Unilever, if we can get them to start changing, that's our strategy. And so we're meeting with the CEO in a week and a half of Ben & Jerry because we just kept pushing. We've analyzed all the data on um, how the dairy cows are treated. The dairy cows only last 2.4 lactations. I mean, by the time that they're sent to the feedlot, they're only five years old. They're like baby cows. You know, but they max out the production from them for the first two and a half years, and then 57% of the meat in the meat market, beef in the meat market, is dairy cow meat. And Dairy cow meat has the highest levels of antibiotics. So we're trying to use Ben & Jerry's as an object lesson. Okay, if we can get Ben & Jerry's to switch, then we can probably get Green Mountain Greek yogurt because they need low-fat milk and Ben & Jerry's needs high-fat milk, right? So. How do we support that? How do we help you out? We oh, well, us. we have a website and a PayPal. You can give us money. <laughs> <laughs> And not just that, but we take, um, we, um, you know, take volunteers. We do a lot of stuff. Where and that's we, Regeneration Vermont? Regeneration Vermont. What about New Hampshire? I mean, we work, up, I mean, we live right on the edge of the Connecticut River, so when we look across the river, we see you guys. <laughs> you know, we, we're, not, we're not prejudiced. And also, uh, in our situation, on our side of the river, um, New Hampshire was one of the first states that had a state uh, of, of certification process for organic farms. It was actually a little more stringent than the federal ones that were originally. And uh, New England was where NOFA, the, which originally was the Natural and Organic Farming Association, now I can't remember the name of the new acronym, but that's where it was born. Um, MOFCA, the, the Maine Organic Farmers Association, had already been in existence when NOFA started. And so it started here in New England in New Hampshire and Vermont, and then spread to multiple states across the country. In our state, uh, the number of uh, the amount of acreage and the interest in organic farming continues to grow, but it is still uh, uh, farming is still dominated by non-organic enterprises. So it's increasing. It continues to increase. It offers marketing opportunities to many of our growers, and with the ability to, uh, with local markets that are consumer driven because a lot of ours are direct sales, we have the ability to move stuff faster than some other parts of the country. And how do we support that? Um, I guess part of it is uh, buy with your feet. If you want to see more organic uh, 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 growing, then go patronize the growers that do this. Tell them you do so, buy their products. Uh, that will help move that agenda if that's what you wish to do. I'm going to interrupt and I'm going to pose my own question, if I may. Um, and I'll get to you and I'll get, we'll get to some others. Um, I think the political aspects are really interesting and we're sort of talking about sort of wide production of, of, of food, um, what we eat and what we can do in terms of production there. I'm kind of interested a little bit to get a, turn this discussion a little bit towards what can we do in our backyard. Most of us have, well I own an acre of land um, and probably um, most of the trees um, and there's a little bit of stuff in the front that looks a little bit like lawn, and a little bit of stuff in the front looks like gardens. But I'm sort of wondering what, um, you know, any comments about what we might do in our own um, little quarter acres or third an acre? Comments from anybody? Hello, everybody. Uh, I learned a lot about pesticides tonight, and um, I am a landscape architect, and uh, from my point of view, at on the local level, on the local backyard level, most of us, there's really no reason to use pesticides on our lawns or on our shrubbery. And I would just not do that personally, and I would suggest that to everybody here. I mean, voting with your feet is what we need to do. Go organic. We can buy organic uh, 
perennials down at Cedar Circle Farm, and you can ask our um, the nurserymen that we frequent to ask them what their policy is on spraying. Obviously, they're trying to produce plants that are uh, for us bug-free, perfect. So we need to not expect that. We need to just back off and try and accept that things are not perfect and that we and, and, and that's the way things are. So if, if all of us at, in our own homes just did not buy any of this product, then I think that would be a good thing for the environment. Um, and then uh, we were chatting a little bit about uh, reducing lawns uh, and just increasing habitat for all of the uh, pollinators and so that's really a question of just stopping mowing. Uh, maybe mow much less. Leave the edges of your garden. Leave leave, leave piles. Just not uh, be perfect or expect that kind of thing from your own garden. And these are things that I would suggest. Simple. Do less. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm going to leave the young woman behind. Okay. Um, thank you so much. I learned a lot. I know you're giving the TikTok. When it's on the calendar. We're going to be there. But uh, my question is this. There are some companies, ticks are a tremendous problem, as you know. And it takes a lot of joy out of the summer for us. And there are companies out there that say they have products like this company called Pure, which will kill ticks, but nothing else. And I just don't, I don't know enough to know, is that true? Is there such a thing as something that will kill all the ticks but not hurt anything else? They're called pliers. <laughs> <laughs> what, what state has the highest incidence of Lyme disease in the entire country? Vermont. Yeah. Vermont by far, almost 10 times the national average. There are products that can be used, and if you choose to apply chemicals, which is one approach, there's an IPM approach, you know, all these very, there are, there are pesticides that can be applied. There's also organic pesticides, some of which contain essential oils from various plants, and some of those products are quite effective, but not so selective that they won't harm anything else. But if your target is ticks, they can work quite well. And there's a product called MET52, which is in a fungus-based insecticide. Uh, again, kills ticks. So there's choices. But to have something that's so selective that it, that it annihilates the ticks and doesn't harm anything else, I've never heard of anything like that. Right. So, so you have to understand if you're going to use that choice the pros and the cons, and um, there are some that are more selective than others. There's all kinds of choices. My publications and the whole, I've got a whole page on tick stuff that's on the website. You can check it out. Yes? Hi, I have two questions. One, I have a blueberry patch. I spent a lot of time on it over in Vermont, 2,000 feet up. And a friend told me about this Japanese beetle trap, and I used it. Because the beetles, forget about leaves, they were eating my blueberries. And I worked too hard. We would have netting, but they could get through the netting. And it, so your system, which I think is quite a nice Rube Goldberg, as we say, uh, your system, with the top. Yeah, but that wouldn't slide off the, uh, the blueberries. Say, say again? I think you said you take your hand and you push the. You, you disturb the vegetation or the cluster of berries where they are, and they all drop off into the funnel. And so if you do it the right way, it can be quite effective. There are other alternatives as well, but that's what I use in my situation on my grapes. And uh, I'm going to be starting with berries this next year, and on my uh, raspberries and blackberries. What part of the state are you in? I'm near uh, Mount Holly, near uh, Okimo. 2,000 feet up. So, so that's one of the places where the Japanese beetles haven't been there too many hundred years, whereas I'm where they've been around a little bit longer. The first years they're there for a few years, that's a real serious wave of them and they're pretty tough to deal with. Could I also ask you quickly about ticks? Because when we first went to Vermont 60 years ago, 
cakes were not an issue, and they weren't an issue 30 years ago or 25, and all of a sudden we're getting ticks up there, 2,000 feet. They're, so they're not your new. question, oh, so How your question is? How Vermont had this big tick problem? Um, Vermont and New Hampshire share the same situation and the same history, I assume, uh, in that uh, ticks seem to be reestablishing in areas where they may have been wiped out earlier. In my state, around the 1860s to 1880s and 1890s, uh, the entire southern half of the state was pretty much all the forests were cut down, everybody was raising sheep, I guess merino sheep and others, and that was the money maker of the time. Ticks, the, the greatest mortality factor for ticks is drying out. And so in a woodland situation with lots of shrubs and so forth, they do really well. In a pasture where things are chomping down the vegetation constantly, they do not survive well at all. So any ticks that might have been here in the colonial period pretty much got wiped out, at least in my part of the state. And then slowly, as the forest regrew, they've slowly been reinvesting this area. When you don't have any wings and you're as small as a tick, it takes you a long time to reinvade. And so it takes them a long time. We're also making changes to the habitat that make it even better for the ticks. But that's more, more on that next week in Thetford. Well, let me just say another thing you can do um, that works really well for um, taking care of insects, you can vacuum right off the plant. You have a little dust buster, you can vacuum up insects right off the plant. And they have machines for uh, farmers where they have uh, vacuums that go through the field and they vacuum all of these pests up and a lot of organic farms use vacuums all the time. Big, big vacuums. Big bug vacs. They go right over the rows. Right. And so you can vacuum a lot of these things off and, you know, and, and save the stuff. I mean, use a clean canister when you do it. Save the stuff and you can make a little pesticide out of it. You just cook it up with a little bit of, with vinegar and just spray it right back on the plant. It really works well. But you can vacuum up a lot of stuff, and it's you know makes it really easy. I like this little you know collection device. I wish I could patent it then. Yeah. <laughs> All the questions so seem to be on this side guys. of the audience. It's not. So good. He had a question. Though, yeah, you had a question a long time ago. Am I next? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Uh, we'll get we'll get over there. You know, first, in the ant orchards over the years, uh, obviously there's historic ant orchards, and there's some new ant orchards. What's the legacy effect on us getting our, not spending the apples, but the apple cider out of our uh, legacy uh, apple orchards? I'm not concerned about pesticide residues from our ancestors, from our parents or grandparents or great grandparents, because those materials are in the soil and they don't tend to get the ones that they've used don't get translocated up and put in and end up in the cider. What I would worry about would be the current practices in use. And there are uh, organic uh, orchards in this state as well as in my state. It's a tough road to hoe to raise apples organically because the systems penalize for these little cosmetic blemishes that just make a little dimple in the skin and yet it's low quality. So it's hard for them, but there are growers up here that do it. Many of the growers that remain are doing their very best to walk this very difficult line where people demand blemish-free products, but also demand no pesticides have been used, and it's very hard for them to, to negotiate that. So we're doing our best to assist them in these, uh, in these endeavors. Um, the materials that are being used today um, are not the kinds of things that I would be concerned about winding up in the, in the cider, at least with what we're doing now. There aren't systemics that are allowed in those crops. So I don't have a concern along those lines, but even I'm not the only one with the answers. Even though it's an old orchard that's been had arsenic in it back in the 40s and the 30s and the 50s, in, you're not concerned about that. No, I'm not. And the in fact, don't in, seem to take it up. Okay. In our state, there was a, a study done in the 19, early 1980s. Two studies that were where they were selected, done by the uh, environmental uh, risk research group at the Division of Health and Human Services. And they specifically designed these studies to look for pesticides in water. And they deliberately picked existing wells that were sited right where there used to be apple orchards. 
because they knew back in the 40s and 50s there would have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of, of all these various arsenicals and potatoes and so on. And they didn't find a single pesticide. I got the one inch thick report. They couldn't find a single pesticide in any of them that they tested for. They were absolutely astonished. And uh, uh, table after table said, Does, cannot find, cannot find, cannot detect, cannot detect. It was unbelievable. And they were looking for this kind of thing too. So they were looking in groundwater. And of course, uh, I don't expect those kinds of things in groundwater. There are other places where you can smell and taste the pesticides in the groundwater, including parts of California that have had that problem and make the rest of us thankful that we don't have some of those problems. But for apple orchards in that situation, no, I'm not concerned. That's me anyway. Can I make another comment? Yeah. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time in the Czech Republic doing research. I'm a geologist. And one of my friends over there said, don't ever drink the flip of it. And I said, why? And he said, well, historically, during the communist era, all the plum orchards were planted along the roadside because they needed the other farmland for other row crops, mustard, whatever else. And therefore, the lead content was exceedingly high. Interesting. Forget it. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. So I have a question about these weeds. You mentioned, you know, it kills caterpillars, right? Fungus kills caterpillars. What about <coughs> eggs and larvae and um, the adults? Does it affect them as well or just the caterpillars? Uh, Will made a point that there's more than one type of BT. There's various strains of it. So there's various strains that are used in products that are caterpillar strains. And there's one strain that's used to kill the larvae of black flies and mosquitoes. So there's different strains. So the answer is different for the strains you're asking about. But basically, um, it's a stomach poison that has to work by things ingesting it. So it can't harm the eggs because the egg can't ingest it until the caterpillars hatch and eat it. And it uh, can't harm the adults because they've already escaped. They, they're, they're, we can't seem to put it in a way that they would pick it up. So it's aimed at the caterpillars, and of course if you spray it on the caterpillars or on the plants that you want to protect, then it's a, a way of being selective and not harming the things that are problems that aren't problems elsewhere. So it, it uh, have I answered your question or have I gone around it? Yeah, no, pretty much. I hate those tomato hornworms, and um, they are gross. And, um, but I wouldn't want to do anything to like, kill monarch butterflies. Uh, then I wouldn't spray it on milkweed. Right. So, uh, and that's that's the, the answer. I, I spray it on my tomatoes because I don't like hornworms either. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's what I do in my garden, and I almost never have a hornworm problem now. Uh, if I if I see the little things starting to hatch and develop, I apply it on it, and I I, I don't worry about it. So it, 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 I like that it's a selective material that I also use selectively. I don't bother on the things where I can tolerate a little bit of chewing. But some of the things I don't, I, I shouldn't say, I, I served friends and we served broccoli and there were some caterpillars in the broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> got to be careful about some of those things. Well, um, let me just comment about, there was a, a section in Alan's talk, remember, where the material was applied at the wrong time of the day. And one piece of good advice you can think about, let's say you're going to buy ladybugs and release them into your garden to try to take care of aphids or some other pests that you have. And you release them into your garden, well, one of the things you can do is mix up a little bit of yeast and a little bit of maple syrup. Lowest grade maple syrup you can find. Find somebody that's sugaring and get their junk. But that's really all you need is a little sugar content. And you mix that up in a sprayer and you spray that on the plant in the evening when you release the beneficial insects. Because the thing is, the, the ladybugs are looking for nectar. They're looking, um, and they're, because they need nectar to have sex, right? That's part of their metamorphosis. That's part of their sex act. They have to have nectar, but they also have to have water. They're thirsty. They're coming out of, of, of being basically in prison. I mean, you're, you're buying a beneficial insect. You know, it's been in somebody's refrigerator, and so you're going to release it. It's thirsty, and it needs nectar. And the babies need chitin, and they need meat. And chitin is the shell 
of the of the insect. And when the nymph is feeding after it's hatched out from the mom, the mom is looking around for water and nectar so it can have sex. The baby is looking around for meat and chitin, right? And so you have to think of that. Those things have to be there for you to have a success rate with your beneficial insect. And we all need to be sweet when we have sex. And so do the ladybugs. Go to the ladybugs. Please wait. I have a Japanese beetle question. We have a patch of wild raspberries that rarely has a Japanese beetle, and then about 100 yards away, cultivated raspberries that get eaten uh, by Japanese beetles. Is there a difference in susceptibility of uh, varieties of raspberries or other plants? Uh, or is it the ecology in which the two different patches are? Wrong. Are there any other questions? <laughs> the, uh, there are varietal differences, and sometimes they show definite preferences of one variety versus another, or one that's in a stage, certain stage versus another one that's starting to bloom or produce a, a, a fruit. And um, other than to say something like that, I can't account for the differences. There's also natural variability spot to spot. And there are natural enemies that attack these things, some of which may be more abundant in one area and less abundant than another. So there's various possible things that could contribute to the pattern <coughs> you report. I have some roses that the Japanese people don't touch and others they just decimate. And they're all pretty much in a close enough area that I don't think it's anything other than they don't like some of them or they do like the others. Uh, and that could be, um, I started, a, I was going to start a study a few years ago, but it, we didn't get funding for it, where we noticed that my neighbor was growing some geraniums, and some of the geraniums had white petals, and uh, some of the others had uh, different colored petals. And day after day, under the white petal plants, we would find dead Japanese beetles. What's going on? It turned out to be that uh, some of some of the things are toxic to the beetles, and yet they don't know it. And so we were going to investigate this a little bit farther and see what we could do. And I found some research demonstrating that we know that occurs, and that certain of the pigments are toxic, but we weren't funded, so we didn't go in that direction. <coughs> so there's all kinds of potential answers that uh, sometimes they, they, they like it and they don't know anybody uh, any better, and other times they don't like the taste, and maybe because there's some toxins there. So there's a, a number of potential uh, contributors to that situation, including that there's different uh, pigments, some of which are toxic to them. Interesting. Let, let me give another example of like, um, there's all kinds of different variations in species of, of crops. And take squash, for example. A lot of people get squash bugs on their squash. Well, there's one variety, well actually there's two or three varieties, the red curry and Turk's turban. Those two squashes especially are attractive uh, squash beetles, right, the squash bugs. And so um, what we do is we put those there as a trap crop. And then when the squash beetles go there, the squash bugs go there, you can vacuum them right off of that trap crop. And they don't go into your other crop, right? And so you can, you know, you can use different uh, strategies like that. We saw in Cuba where they were using just a one line of corn, and I said, why are they growing one line of corn? It's not going to pollinate, right? Because you usually need three or four rows to pollinate, right? So, um, so we were looking at it, and I said, oh, they're using that as a pest control because the same pest that, um, that deals with uh, broccoli really is an aphid, and that aphid really is um, like the ants monitor those aphids and then they um, they suck the honeydew out of the of the aphids and so they're like those aphids are in a little pasture right and they the, the they protect the aphids from uh, the ladybugs they will actually fight off the ladybugs and so the Cubans had figured out oh they like the corn better than they like the broccoli so I'm taking care of my my aphid problem in the corn instead of letting it be in the broccoli. And so there's all kinds of little tricks like that you can do, and you know, after farming for 50 years, we figured out a few of them. <laughs>
This has been great. We're sort of running out of time here. I really hate to break up the questions. Um, I think some people will be, um, it's going to take us a little bit of time to, to sort of break down. And um, um, there's a chance to come over here and look at the displays. And I want to pass the microphone here on to uh, Barbara McElroy, who's been a key in putting this together. John, I just think thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you. or maybe building a bigger one, or want to know about making a small meadow, I urge you to um, come to the next meeting in the series on the 26th of, of this month, after Easter. And also, there will be an, in the, a field uh, exercise at Chuck Worcester's Farm in, in Hartford, where we will learn about establishing meadows, maintaining the meadows, mowing, which is a huge problem. With, you know, you notice the road crews may be taking out all of the asters and yeah. Yeah. goldenrod right when they're at their peak. And so there's nothing out there for the fall pollinators. So we, um, so take that blue sheet and make, mark your calendars. Good stuff is happening. So, thank you. Thank you.